So this is the, the second of the cafe talks. Um, and we have three more after this. So as you think of questions that you have or thoughts or want to check back in, we, we, it's, it's great to come back and you can hop on for 30 minutes. You can stay the whole hour and a half. So, um, so, you know, we talk about a lot of the cover crop benefits for soil health, but in this case, we're going to be talking mainly about managing, managing water and how to use cover crops to do that. Um, one of the cover crops that I really like um, is the dwarf Essex rapeseed. And, um, and I like it because of the root structure, but you know, mainly when we're using these cover crops, we're looking to get some different root structures in the soil, some different depths of rooting to, to use moisture at different soil layers and throughout the profile. Uh, but one of the things we talked about yesterday is if you are, if you do have canola in rotation, um, using brassicas like rapeseed, turnip, or radish um, can cause club root concerns. So be sure to steer clear of those in your cover crop mixes. Um, as you select them, just, just leave it out if you don't want to transfer any of those, um, have club root concerns if you have canola in rotation. Um, this is a PP field from last year that, um, that was just radish, turnip, and uh, peas. And it was going to be grazed after September 1 when that date got pushed up. Um, another tip, if you're going to corn in 2021, don't use just radish and turnip. I, I think it's tempting because of the small seed size that you could just broadcast it out there and maybe use vertical tillage or something to incorporate it. Um, but you could have phosphorus uptake issues uh, in corn the following year because you're putting, if you just use radish and turnip, you're using two non-mycorrhizal species and corn needs mycorrhiza to take up phosphorus. Um, so including a grass or even legumes have mycorrhizal associations uh, is a good thing. And so in this case, having the pea in there uh, is gonna help with that for the following year. But just throwing in a grass is really a, a good idea um, and not just having a radish and turnip dominated mix. Um, this is a full season high water table, uh, sandy soil. I think Tyler, you know this field. Um, we, we looked at it on a tour that you did. And this one was gonna be grazed. It wasn't PP, but the intention was to be grazed. And I, I put this one in here because of sorghum. Um, I'm not sure if this is sorghum or sorghum sedan grass in here. Um, but using, Marisol was talking last week about that being an excellent warm season option for, for drying out wet soils. Um, and typically it's around two pounds per acre. We talked last week about maybe five pounds per acre would be, would be good in a mix. Um, but it does put on a lot of biomass, as you can see how tall it gets. So if that's something you're uncomfortable with, just make sure you're watching that, that cover crop. Um, and if, if you need to spray it out and terminate it, then you spray it out and terminate it. That's just how it goes. So, um, so there's another option for, for a mix that could be used. Um, one of the things that we'd done a couple years ago uh, was look at some different cover crop mixes and um, versus bare soil. So these are all the different mixes that we used. And then this is the bare soil um, in a PP situation. So you can see how, um, how those, those cover crop mixes were drying out the soil profile evenly with depth. And so this green line here is mix number six, which was one of the most diverse mixes we had. Um, a cereal rye, dwarf Essex rapeseed, and we had some sugar beet, sunflower, pea, and flax in that mix. Um, and it did pretty well at drying that soil out. But the other mixes did similar things with, with same uh, drying out through the profile. When you look at the bare soil, if we're just managing it with tillage, you can see how it dries the surface out. But right below the surface is a bulge of moisture. And I think that's what we're trying to get rid of in PP and that we want to make sure we prep that field for the following year by managing moisture efficiently. And so this is pretty telling. Um, as, to, as to how effective cover crops can be um, versus just managing a PP area with tillage. Um, nitrogen, of course, uh, the uptake of nitrate and avoiding leaching. Um, so here the, the levels weren't very high, but, but we saw that the cover crops took up whatever nitrogen was there. We don't know when that's released, but at least it's stored in, in plant biomass and not lost uh, to the groundwater. Um, the following year, you can see how cover crop residue, this is from some of those diverse mixes, really isn't, um, isn't as scary as you think it might be. The, these are basically, the, the radishes, they decompose, just turn into almost, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain it, but you can just break it apart easily and it's very kind of just dry material. Um, so this would be no problem to plant into. You can see the, the barley residue next to it is, is just about the same. So if you're thinking of what it's like to plant into some of this residue, it's going to be similar probably to planting into some kind of small grain residue the following year. Maybe even better in some cases because of the, 
because of the um, decomposition from the diversity of the mix. Uh, but the, one of the worst things you could do is go in after a full season cover crop and work it up. Um, so here you can see all the radish and turnip laying on the surface and how that's really, the, you know, the radish and turnip are going to decompose much better in the soil over winter versus tilling them and getting them on top. So, um, so leaving those fields as is and just planting into them the next year is, is what we recommend. Um, if you're going to add, I had a question the other day about adding or what cover crop mix could be used where they want to do some tillage in the fall and do their um, fertility. And so in that case, I recommended, and I don't know if this is right or not, but I would just recommended using something like oats and then terminating it before it heads out so that it stays kind of vegetative and not getting really straw-like. Um, because if you're gonna work it up, you don't want a huge root mass and you don't want all these large radish and turnips um, and some of the other benefits that you would have by leaving it in place, you would just lose with, with tillage. In the fall. So best to just leave it in place if you can and plant into it the next year. Um, there are questions about whether you to do a mix or a monoculture. Um, and so here you can see a side by side of the two. It just really depends on what you want to accomplish on that field or what your weed pressures may be. So if you feel like you have high weed pressure in a field and putting in a diverse mix is just going to lead to cover crops plus weeds, then maybe you go with a monoculture of grasses and leave the opportunity to, to spray. Uh, do a herbicide pass or two during the summer to control your weeds. Um, so it just depends on what your goal is. If you are going to do a diverse mix, always start with a weed-free field. Um, make sure you take care of business and, and get it prepped. Um, also repair any ruts or do any ditching that you may need to do on that field before seeding a cover crop. Um, cover crops are great, but they can't work miracles. Um, so let's not set too high of expectations for, for some of these things to repair some deep ruts or to make the field level again. They, they can't do that. So um, make sure you do all your work that you need to prior to planting the cover crops or you have good success. Um, and in a lot of cases, it doesn't need to be that expensive for a diverse mix. Um, so 20 bucks an acre, 28 pounds per acre seeding rate is what this field is. And I think it looks, it looks pretty darn good. Um, you could also do the monoculture here, cereal rye, 40 to 50 pounds uh, per acre, pretty, I think of 10 bucks an acre. Um, so this is a, a great option too. This farmer did this to leave himself an option with a herbicide pass and, and he was very happy with how that turned out. The rye, because it didn't overwinter or vernalize, it just stayed pretty low to the ground um, and it obviously didn't head out. So it looks pretty good. Um, if you're just going to use grasses, there may be some ideas of, of using a mix like oats and barley um, to help you avoid issues with PP payments. I don't know how insurance feels about some of those things, but um, if you have just a single, like just a stand of oats, then maybe there's the possibility that you could take it to harvest. Um, so if you just mix it with another grass, maybe that's a good way to ensure that you're not going to take a cover crop for grain. Um, but talk about those issues with your insurance provider and and see what they're comfortable with also. Um, and if you, if you do uh, something like that and you wanna terminate it before it heads out, uh, that was something we talked about at our cafe talks last year. Um, that'll keep the, the residue maybe a little bit easier to plant into the following year. Um, it might just be something you wanna do. And if conditions are getting too dry this summer, if, if we do get a drought or something, make sure that you're just managing it and you can always spray out the cover crop uh, when you feel like you need to. So those are just a few um, kind of starting ideas just to get us thinking and going and, and uh, discussing. So, um, so I wanna make sure I point out that on this call we have Naeem Kalwar from up in Langdon um, and Joe Eichley from Weed Science. Weed Science, what did we decide your title is Joe? Weed Management, Weed Science, Extension Weed Scientist Specialist? <laughs> yeah, they wanna call me a specialist, not a scientist, so. Okay, that's so what I would love to. <laughs> and then also Marisol Berti was able to hop on today and um, she's our, our cover crop and forage uh, research faculty on campus. So does anyone have any, any questions that, you've, that have come up or things that you're thinking about on your field or want to talk about a specific field that you um, are looking to manage? Hey, hey, Abby, this is Roger down here in uh, Dickey County. And so I've got property up at, uh, in Western Stutzman County We've got corn on it right now. We hope to harvest here maybe next week. And so we need to uh, get rid of all the corn stalks, uh, cultivate and do some rock picking, which hasn't been done in years. 
Uh, so we want to clean up the field. And then my concern was uh, worried about uh, erosion. So I wanted to do uh, a cover crop this summer. And so you've given me a couple ideas. So it sounds like we should lean toward rye or oats or barley to do our cover crop. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think you could do that. So you're going to, so you get the, the 2019 corn off of it. What crop are you going to go to next year? That would be. Um, I'd, I'd kind of like to go to beans, soybeans. I'd, I'd like to get back into a soybean uh, corn rotation, which we haven't, we haven't done for a couple of years. Okay, then yeah, in that case, I think um, some of the things that I've been talking about other growers with on corn acres that are going to be harvested um, this year would be, would be yeah, to come in with something like oats um, on that field. You could also see something like cereal rye if you want it to, to start growing, but to stay low. And then it, it probably some of it will over winter and you can plant your soybean into that next spring in case it's wet again. Um, that may be an option as well, or you could do some kind of mix of oats and rye. Um, Marisol, do you know how much of that rye that we see this summer on PP ground will overwinter and, and be there next spring? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, rye uh, will survive, uh, but it, it won't survive as good. You know, it, you know usually winter annuals, uh, you know, like rye or, you know, they don't like the heat of the summer. So it's better to plant a little later, but I don't know when uh, you're planning uh, to plant this cover crop, but the later you plant it in the summer, the rye, the better it's gonna do to overwinter. Um, like uh, brassicas, like uh, winter canola or uh, dwarf Essex or anything else that might survive, it's gonna have a hard time uh, surviving if you put it earlier, like camelina. Camelina really doesn't survive if you plant it. September 1st. But rye doesn't seem to be as sensitive to the heat, but it could be a difference on different cultivars or varieties too. Um, so there are things to consider. But like Gabby says, if you're gonna, you know, um, depends what you're gonna plant next year, but uh, oats and barley work really well too. Now it depends if you have a lot of moisture on the soil. My guess is maybe you, you do since you couldn't harvest the corn. I would still put some sorghum maybe uh, this summer if that's what you know the cover crop you want it is for removing water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one thing I would stay away from would be turnips. <laughs> so I, I just keep hearing nightmares of of turnips overwintering possibly in some of those fields and then getting stuck on your your cutter bar, especially if you're um, harvesting soybean the following year. So um, so yeah, any of those grasses sound like they like they may work and sorghum might be a good idea too, like Marisol's saying, to, to burn up some moisture. I know what Western Stutzman is just yeah. drowning in water right now, so. Yeah, we have an amazing amount of water. Um, we yeah. have on, on this land, on this land we have done, it's just a small farm of 500 acres. But we have uh, done no-till planting, and I've surprised with my renter, and it has worked out surprisingly well. Okay. So I was wondering um, if we go back to the no-till, you know, is there is there specific types of cover crops that would make the no-till next year easier? You know, I think, um, so in, in Setsman County, some of the growers I work with, I don't know if your soil's more the higher clay soil over there for it's the sandy. Um, yeah, correct. But, but if it's if it's kind of variable like that, I think, you know, in the sandier soil, some of the farmers I work with in that area are are using things like oats and um, and peas and things like that. Okay. On soils, and it's working pretty well. On the higher clay soils that they have, they're using, they're using rye. Um, so they're, they want that moisture usage in the spring, but they're watching it carefully and terminating it early if they need to in the spring uh, to avoid too much moisture loss. Um, what else are they doing over there? They're also variable rate seeding rye. So they're doing lower rates on the hilltops and higher rates down below in the, okay. in the lower ground. So that may be an option too, to kind of hedge your bets on. You know, it is because my land, my land is rolling. It's not, it's not level to say the least. Um, but, uh, and again, would you reiterate the type of cover crop to use again on this? You were saying oats? Yeah, I think oats would be a good bet for, um, for sandier soils and using okay. some of the cereal rye that, that may overwinter on the higher clay soils. Um, okay. 
Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Or you could do, you know, you could do 30 pounds of oats and 10 pounds of rye. You know, you could kind of, you know, offset have, a little bit that way too. So you have something overwintering, but not, not a lot. Have these growers also used barley? Um, they haven't used it as much as they've used rye and oats. I think just because they okay. like the residue better on oats for planting into the following year. And they're both no-tillers. Um, so I think they, they just like the, the residue on oats a little bit better than they do barley. Uh, we bought this we bought this property about a dozen years ago and the organic matter due to poor farming practices was quite low so i'm trying to take some positive steps here to uh, build up our or organic content within the soil so we're, we're making steps slowly good well that that should help i mean we've seen some great things with um and sandy soils with with using cover crops so hopefully that helps you build up some some of that and then you know short season crops are a good idea too if the soil is really sandy um, get it out get the crop on get it off and then have more time for a cover crop to grow um, so yeah this this was this was an old dairy farm and, uh, and so uh, after i bought it then i started plowing up the barnyard and planting potatoes out there and it, it's like the perfect soil for growing potatoes <laughs> um, and it's it's amazing it's amazing what that soil produces and the uh, soil out in the field tends to be, you know, um, the first year we grew beans out there, uh, we had 40 bushel beans. And so it, I go, wow, there is potential for this, quote, worthless land, as the locals described it to me. Oh, well, imagine what you can do with it then. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've had some good uh, corn yields out there. Uh, now, one year we had, we had, corn hitting two, over 200 bushels per acre in, in certain locations. But, you know, I've got the sandy hilltops and uh, the, the valleys or the bottomland is uh, lots of beautiful loam. So the, our, the soil types on that farm, uh, um, five different soil types for one, for one uh, quarter section of land. It's amazing. <laughs> Jeez. So thank, thank you for your insight. Yeah, you're welcome. I have one question um, for Roger and Marisol. So like I was uh, thinking about what Marisol recommended, um, oats, barley, and sorghum. So say if you use that mix, Roger, question for you is what are you planning to do with the residue, say, whenever you are able to cut it? Because if you just leave the residue standing, then there may be some problems for next year if you use that mix. And the question, same, um, you know, with the same mix for Marisol is, Marisol, would it be better if uh, Roger, say, included a legume in that, for example, field peas? For, so say if he cuts the residue, would it help uh, break down the residue for him uh, to? Well, I just mentioned the sorghum because of the water. I, I didn't complete the mix, but mm -hmm. I completely agree that if, if it, this is a PP mix and you mm -hmm. want to, you should have a variety of crops and field pea would mm -hmm. be a great addition to have in there, not just grasses. I was just thinking more of the water thing, but yep. you know. I actually so like your so idea. We're done with, with that with Abby, we include like uh, at least five. I always say the components, you know, or the mix that you have a cool season grass, a warm season grass, mm -hmm. a cool season legume, a warm season legume, mm -hmm. if you can or it's not too expensive. And then mm -hmm. something else, brassica, uh, mm -hmm. at least one brassica or some, something else. Then you have all the mm -hmm. functions that these plants do to the soil. Now, the question too of putting, you know, I, I think you're right, Naim, you could have maybe too much residue. This is going to depend if you have any possibility of grazing. So I don't know, Roger, is there any? Are you oh, yeah. I, uh, my renter has uh, hundreds of cattle, so uh, we've grazed this land before. Just yeah. you know, bringing the cattle in to uh, finish up any corn that's on the ground. So yeah, we still have that possibility. So in that case, yeah. um, having sorghum would not be a problem if you can. If the BP day continues to be November first, you're going to have to race after that. But then it will, I wouldn't worry so much about the residue. But you mm -hmm. got a good point, name. I think we always have to consider the same. Like Abby says, I don't put turnip if you're not grazing it. It's mm -hmm. the same same concept. You know, the the mix has to change if you're not going to graze it to have okay. less residue or huge turnips. You know, these years, the first year I've seen so many cover crops survive 
in Fargo. I've been 10 years doing the same trial of cover crops with 20 some species, and usually just winter rye or winter cavalina survives. This year, we have the turnip survive, and just like you said, the, the bulbs or the roots are hard as a rock. So uh, if a planter goes through those <laughs> balls, it's, they're gonna get stuck on the disc and, cause, and drag it through the field and cause all kinds of problems. So she's very right that if you wanna use things like uh, turnip, you need to have grazing in the system. Radish is not so bad because radish melts away completely. You know, you don't see the roots left and I didn't see any radish survive. So radish does not survive the winter. This, this year would have been the one you really see what survives or not, <laughs> because, um, you know, we had uh, crimson clover survive, uh, the dwarf Essex canola survive, tur turnips, 3D kale, rye, canalina, uh, even some winter peaks, which I usually don't see, <laughs> they, were, they survived this year. So, but yeah, that's good, Roger. I think uh, you should include a mix with uh, some variety, maybe that five different cover crops, and try to keep it... Uh, you know, a reasonable price. That's why I always said it would be nice to have also warm season legume, but warm season legume like cowpeas or sun hemp are a little bit expensive. And so if you don't have that, just having a cool season cheap legume like pea is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right. yeah, we'll, we will try to keep, uh, I'd like to keep the, keep the cost under $20 an acre. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, so we, right. have, um, we did a calculator with uh, Miranda uh, Mihan and uh, in uh, Mary, uh, Mary Kina from Carrington, they say a uh, cost cover crop cost calculator. Uh, Abby, maybe you can send the link. Is that link already available? I I'll look for it. I um I can ask Miranda, but we could post that on the Prevent Plant. Uh, yeah, because it is it calculates your price. You know, it has okay. a, like an average price. So it calculates more or less how much it's gonna cost you, and then on the application you can change that. Uh, the column to the real price. Once once you decide they're going to buy it, then you can switch the price or whatever it's going to cost you in the seed company, and then I'll tell you. But at least you can play with it, making mixes that are going to cost you less, more or less, less than twenty dollars an acre. Okay. So it's right, it's kind of a basic thing. It's just we put all the cover crops on the list. Um, you you are allowed to put the seed rate you want, and then the prices we have in there are the regular prices we we found on five or six different seed companies um, from last year. So it should be pretty close, but we, like I said, we, it has, the program has a column that allows you to put the real price once you, you ask or quote the prices of the seeds from the seed company. So I think that will help you to put things and change your rates and to, you know, to keep you under the $20 per acre. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. So, Roger, coming back, you answered, if you have the grazing option to me personally, like barley, oats, uh, field peas, and um, sorghum, would another op would be another option for you? Because I'm assuming if you're standing corn, you have some water issues. And oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that mix, and then again, what the mix Abby suggested, would work best probably on some spot, but some spots, if you could see the utilization of this mix, I was slightly worried about the residue, but if you have the grazing option, that's wonderful. Okay, all right. Yeah, that we do. Does anyone else have a field they wanna bring up and we'll brainstorm. I really like this. It makes me, gets me kind of excited to hear all the different options go around. Well, a couple of years ago, I went to the cover crop demonstration there at NDSU and uh, that was quite enlightening. And so I kind of put that in the back of my memory. And so when this came up, when this uh, unusual uh, growing season last year came up, uh, um, my thought was to return back a return and explore for the first time the the uh, cover crop on my land uh, since we're not going to be able to uh, seed anything this year so oh, that's great it is I mean really on prevent plan I have a lot of you know different farmers where they'll they'll even they'll, they'll seed most of the field into whatever mix they're going to use but then they'll leave a strip out there where they're just going to broadcast some different cover crop seeds to to check them out and see what they like and what they don't like 
on a smaller scale. Um, and that, those are, that's kind of a fun way to, to look at some different options and see, see what things like sun hemp look like and what do the roots look like? And is it something you want to manage or feel good about um, putting in a whole field? So uh, let, me ask, let me ask you one question. Uh, to get the cover crop started, uh, we had thought of just doing broadcast do they actually germinate and root into the soil or do we need to uh, uh, disc, disc in or till in some of the uh, cover crop seeds? Um, you know, with, with the larger seed, like, like peas, if you're going to have that in your mix, I think that would, you'd want to seed it. Um, okay. Get okay. a good stand. And, and especially in this opportunity, if you, if you need to deal with some of the residue on that field, but then come back in with a, with a drill and seed the mix, I think you get the best results and best coverage. Um, okay. Lot of yeah, that, that, make, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because as soon as yeah, if you if if there are some gaps in the the cover crop mix, especially if you have a mix of grasses and and broadleaves, um, then weeds can come in those areas, and then you've got to make a choice to spray it all your broadleaves across the field. Yeah. Okay. And that's sure. A tough decision. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, folks, for, for this morning. It's been very enlightening. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. See anyone else have a field that they're that they want to kind of throw out there with some options to talk through options? Abby, just to keep the discussion going, we could make some points out of the discussion we had yesterday. You know, so that you know, I know that it's going to be printed in crop and pest report, but you know, for the benefit of this group, we could talk about some points. Like for example. Uh, one thing which was striking for me, Dave friends had mentioned that, like if we, one option could be on PP acres, for example, not to do anything, but then the chances are those acres will go into PP again next year. So leaving them as is is not a good option, you know. So that, I, I just think that, you know, some of the points we discussed yesterday, if we could mention to this group too, um, that would be beneficial for everyone, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing that came up was was the disease transfer between cover crops and the next year's crop. And so we talked about club root um, issues with having a brassica in your cover crop mix going to something like canola. Um, there's also, I don't know if anyone has a copy of this, but this uh, Midwest Cover Crops Field Guide is actually really, really helpful. And there's some pages in here that I was looking at yesterday. Again, I seem to have copies of this booklet everywhere, um, which is great because I use it a lot. Um, but even nematode host susceptibility in cover crops um, is something to consider. So if you're looking at things like like soybean, Abby, you, your voice, Abby, you, Abby, your voice is cutting off. I, I we it? couldn't hear. The oh, last okay. It's just bouncing. It's like echoing. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, let's see. Is that is that better? Is it just because I was turning my head? Maybe. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it was like, weird. Because you're in a connection. Your treats must be getting in the way. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a slow, slow patch of internet right there is what that was. Okay. Well, um, so some of the things that I look at in this uh, Midwest Cover Crops Guide are they have this great table on nematode host susceptibility. And I know, Marisol, you've worked on this some. Um, but for, like, say you have soybean cyst nematode and you have that concerns of that in your field, including things like hairy vetch, field pea, red clover, soybean, sweet clover, those are all hosts. Mm -hmm. um, for soybean cyst nematodes. So if you have pressures like that in your field, you're going to want to stay away from some of those cover crops um, in your mixes. I don't know, Marisol, you've done some other work too with, with Yeah, those. we um, remember uh, we did a, a worksheet, the fact sheet last year for the, the cover crops that we think found, you know, here in, in North Dakota in her research, there are hosts for the soybean cyst. I don't know, we can uh, get that flyer on a link. Remember we had one last year? Yeah, I think I might have it on the um, prevent plant yeah. page. So actually. it's because she has some other things that you should not mention in the cover crop that they were a little bit new. Like um, we know now that turnips are host. Right. And we didn't know, know that. And so that's another one. It's not a very strong host uh, compared to peas and, you know, and other, uh, other legumes. But uh, it is, a, a, you know, what we've seen in the research that we're doing with cover crops and soybean cysts with uh, whipping is that any uh, 
possible host, even if it's a low host, will help the nematode to stay in the soil and increase the population. We've seen that even people that are using um, resistant soybean varieties, they still uh, can multiply the population by six fold, six times. It still can increase it. The, the, this nematode has a huge uh, ability to increase population even if, if it's a poor host. Okay, uh, so I think stay away from anything if you know you have soybean seeds on your soil. Testing for soybean seeds is important. Um, it would be good that you send the test because sometimes you don't know you have it. Um, and uh, usually when the soybean seeds uh, start showing symptoms, it's because you have a lot of them, <laughs> right? This is the call a silent uh, problem. It won't show yield reduction, it won't show symptoms. Uh, well, actually, we'll show, it will have yield reduction without you even knowing it, or 10% or so, um, but it won't show symptoms. And uh, so it's hard to know you have it. So if you suspect that you may have it, I think a lot more people have it than they think. It's nice to know because if you're at low levels, uh, it's good that you do practices to make sure it doesn't increase. Once you have really high levels, like on the 10,000, we found sample, we found a sample uh, of a farmer, it was in Minnesota, so Northern, uh, they had 140,000 <laughs> eggs and 100 cubic centimeters. So you get the population like that, um, it's very hard, you know, to get it back. But if you are in a, a population that's less than 1,000, you know, um, try to keep it that way. This is exponential growth if you provide host. Just, it's almost like this COVID-19. You stay in the 2000 for a long time, and all of a sudden it just goes up <laughs> if the conditions are there, right? So if, if one, one susceptible host you put in there, and the other thing you have to consider, a lot of the weeds are host too. And I think there is a publication by Berlin Nelson in Plant Pathology. They also list, um, maybe we should do a little fact sheet with the weeds are host. Uh, so maybe uh, it'll be good to, to have that uh, handy too. Um, so here with Joe, uh, weed control is important, but if you have soybean seeds nematode, it's more important because some of those weeds are carriers of the, of the uh, host of the nematode. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> uh, this is Ken Nichols with the North Dakota Soybean Council. I just want to re rem remind uh, farmers that uh, we do have a program where they can test their soil, the soil for SCN. And uh, if you get a bag from the county agent or Sam Markell, uh, it's all pre-addressed. You send it in and you'll get the results. So uh, there's no reason for you not to test your soils. It's just going to cost you a little time and throw it in the mail. So That's very good, Ken. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think more people should test their soils because a lot of people have it and don't know. <laughs> Let's see, Joe, is, is there anything? Well, Abby, do we have a link or can do we have a link or something where the farmers can go and, and request a sample to sample? you have a link or something? I don't have a link. They just need to contact their local county agent. And the county agents okay. have the bags. OK. The, it's r run all through Sam Markell. We're just uh, okay. the dollars behind the program. OK, sounds good. They are easily available, Marisol. They, all they need to do is to contact their yeah. a &R agent okay. in the county. Yep. Okay. I even see them in our um, Langdon research center office, you know. Okay. So um, all they need to do is to contact the agency. Do you know, Naeem and Joe, are, are our agents back in the offices for the most part now, or are they still working remotely like, like a lot of us? Most of them I would like to think are, because our county, uh, uh, our courthouse was closed here in Langdon, but um, last uh, agent call I had in, on last Wednesday, 
uh, she was working here out of the office. So I think most of the people are working out of the office. Good. Yeah, it seems to be county by county, but I think most are in the office. And if I remember most, it's by appointment only right now that you can visit them. But that is a county to county difference. So I, it's easiest just to plan on calling ahead and making an appointment. But most of them should be in their offices now. Any other fields that people want to talk about options on? I see also we've got some good uh, seed company representation here too. So I don't know if there's some things that that Chris, Emily, or Colin kind of want to talk about. Um, It seems like seed is available. I see Emily just unmuted. Yeah, sorry, Abby. I just hopped on. What was, are you talking about preventive plant? Yeah, yeah. So I just, um, we, we talked through an option for one field in Stutzman County, but um, I don't know if there are any updates from, from you guys, from the seed companies on, on, on anything or availability or. Um. Yeah, I guess um, I can start it off. I. Uh, we haven't really had anything uh, change availability wise at all. Um, and not since last week when we had this meeting too, nothing has changed for us. But I would say we, uh, it's interesting because we've been getting a lot of calls for preventive plant seed needs from all over the state in areas of the state where we didn't think that there were issues. So it, it's it's really interesting. but. One thing that we definitely see is that there is, it's kind of challenging to make recommendations at times because there's no uh, like one solution that we're really seeing. I mean, we put together some different ideas for people, but there's just so many different things that people are trying to accomplish or things that they're trying to stay away from. Like I saw what you tweeted yesterday, Abby, about staying away from the radishes and turnips if you're going into core next year and putting in some, um, different stuff and I mean that's a great recommendation and you get you have people that are going down that route you have people that are trying to do stuff on the grazing side you have people that are just trying to do something uh, cheap to help soak up moisture and then you've got some people that are trying to really address some soil health concerns so I'd say you know like when you look at all the different regions that are talking PP it's just so different from one farmer to the next. We uh, kind of have started to see uh, where uh, where farmers have would normally be using some warm season stuff right now for talking about preventive plant, like maybe some millets or uh, sorghums or whatever it might be, sedan grass. And we're starting to see some of them uh, thinking about transitioning into the cool season stuff so that way they can make sure that they get growth later into the year. I know one thing that people have been bringing up quite a bit too is the um, paying and grazing deadlines. You know, I think that's something that gets to be a little bit challenging for some of them. Uh, and I think we're kind of blessed with what happened last year when they upped that deadline. So it made it a little bit easier for some of them to be able to come up with some mixed ideas because then they were like, oh, okay, I can go out there a month earlier, that's going to help me a ton. So I, I really wish, well, I kind of wish that that would just be changed indefinitely, but that's definitely been one thing that um, has been a bit, a little bit challenging for some of them, but availability wise, I really, I, I haven't seen anything um, become an issue at all. We do talk with a lot of other suppliers and seed companies nearly every day and you know, whether it's us or some of them, I, I have not seen anything sell out yet or even come close to it. So it sounds like there is a lot of seed out there that can be used for cover crops uh, or for preventive plants. So I don't think anything of, there's anything real concerning about that from our standpoint yet. That's good.
That's good. I suppose a lot of the other states to the south got got things planted early. Um, so we wouldn't run into that same issue we had last year where it was just hard to get a lot of seed. You'd come up with a mix and then, you know, the major component of it, you you know, the grass, the, the oats weren't available or, you know, or something wasn't available to mill it. Um, so it's nice that, that this year we'll have more options. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's, it, it is not like, so far it is not like it, what it was last year. Like you said, it was, you, you would, couldn't get your hands on some oats or millet for some of these people. And no matter where you were looking, I mean, you could look all over the United States and you couldn't find much of that. So it should be better this year for those that end up needing some preventive plant mix. And that's the same way, um, you know, what we're hearing as well, like the millets are uh, in good supply. Um, I think one thing that could maybe be beneficial for uh, maybe livestock guys is potentially utilizing uh, Japanese millet um, or maybe in some saturated soils to be able to soak up that moisture because Japanese millet does work probably uh, pretty well in that scenario. Um, and so that you can soak that up and then be able to hay it or uh, um, graze it, you know, whenever that um, grazing deadline is. Yeah, I think that's a good recommendation, Colin. Um, I like the Japanese millet too, even not too many people use it. The other one is really good because it grows a lot. You know, people use a lot of fox and millet, but fox and millet production is for grazing is, is very low compared to other like sorghum and others, but Japanese millet yields more. And also as another one is the forage pearl millet. Pearl millet usually doesn't produce he seed here, but there's some varieties of forage pearl millet that they're very high yielding uh, and they move a lot of water too. We tested out some of those last year and I really like them, so. Yeah, and in a typical, um, I guess, year, guys who are wanting to use Japanese millet, they're usually, you know, planting like a cool season, uh, like a barley or oats, and they're taking that off and then they're putting Japanese millet to get two cuttings off of it. And then they're going back with either a, you know, like a, with, a, with a winter wheat or maybe even a cereal rye to, and just kind of keep that forage rotation to get as much tons as possible for their, uh, you know, for their livestock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jap Japanese millet, they, well, I, I'm not sure why all these are called millet when they're complete different genus and species. Yeah. Japanese yeah. millet is not even close to the other millets. It, mm -hmm. This is on the same genus, well, I shouldn't say this, but it's a uh, barnyard grass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. barnyard grass. It's a but, um, but, it, you know, it's not weedy. I've seen it and it grows really well. Um, you know, I, I like it when, when I've seen it better than fox and millet. I and mean, fox and millet, it grows, it doesn't produce much. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Joe, as a, as a weed specialist, what, uh, what cover crops do you want us to stay away from um, in our area? Say millet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'm I'm encouraged by the supply of millet. It, so it, it's really those years where it's, you know, like last year where we're scrounging for seed, where it's more of a concern for contamination. But if there's adequate seed everywhere, then you know we have a lot of better chance of getting the um, more quality seed that has less contaminants. So <clears throat> it's really hard to tell. If it's a year in year out thing that we'll have Palmer potentially show up with millet, but I'm not as concerned when there's not a high demand. Um, I just always point towards annual ryegrass. Don't like it. <laughs> uh, you know, the one thing I was thinking with millet, I need to put this on the website. Somehow during the compilation of the weed guide, there's a blank page that was our millet table. So actual herbicides that we can use in millet and still graze and that would be different than prevent plant but people who still want to plant it as a as a forage I need to just put that table on the website Okay, any other thoughts or questions or? Uh, 
I mean, there was one one more point which came up uh, yesterday that, uh, for example, if some people cannot get their fields grazed, for example, and if they planted their cover crops, say in late July and produce, it, it grows good and produces a lot of biomass, some producers may be worried about the next spring. So I thought it was a valid point for crop farmers and we should address that. In my view, if you, if you can just cut the residue and as long as you have a good mix with decent CN ratio, everything will break down. I would not um, encourage tillage because the cover crop roots will create those channels for the water. And um, you know the PowerPoint or the presentation you made in the beginning? I thought one slide was very telling, uh, the moisture use. And 35 or 36 inch, I thought that was the groundwater depth. And if you look at that, the bare soil the, the water level, the moisture level increased because it was coming close to the groundwater depth. Whereas wherever the cover crop mix was, it was still way lower than the bare soil. So just so to prove that not only uh, cover crop roots will use excess moisture in the top soil layers, but they can also lower the groundwater depths. So to me, more biomass can turn into organic matter as long as it breaks down um, during the winter and it's not a nuisance in the spring. Plus, it will, they will dry down the soil and, then, and the root structure will create these channels for the spring melt to go down. So it will improve the infiltration. So I just thought it was a very good point yesterday uh, because not everybody has the option to graze. And then they are worried, oh, what if if I plant it and it produces more biomass, what am I going to do? Because, you know, everybody wants to plant as soon as they can in the spring. So I thought, I thought that was a good point. Yeah, that is. And I think, um, you know, some of that, that residue also we talked about being good for snow catch. Um, yes. Not only is that good for having even, if you, if you have a nice residue, Across the field, it's good for even snow catch across the field, so you don't have a pile up of snow in a low part of the field and making it even more wet. Uh, but also insulating the field so that in the spring, that water can move in faster because it's not frozen as deep. So, um, so that you have all that lighter residue on the surface and the the temperatures maybe a little bit slower to warm, they're probably not as frozen as something without residue. Also, so um, yeah, I've been pretty impressed with with the roots that we've seen. Um, I think it was about the maybe the first year that I was here, or second year that I was here, that we had a lot of prevent plant, and um, and some of those cover crops that people put out there, I can't believe the rooting depth on them. We we did root root pits and and tons of fields, and it was just pretty. It was amazing how deep the roots go. And whenever you pick a mix, if you're looking for for shallow rooted species and deep rooted species, and and you're kind of you're getting all those soil layers having some kind of root tapping into them to, to pull moisture. I think it's really beneficial. So I'm almost less concerned about what's above ground as I am about what's below ground and picking mixes based on root structures um, to get that, that moisture removal. Um, so yeah, those are really good points, Naeem. There's also what, what I saw, um, I was talking to a farmer after this last kind of round of prevent plant and, um, and he was saying that there was a, a PP field the following spring um, right next to a field that had been, had been tilled all, all summer. Um, and the guy was out there spraying it and he drove, he was going just fine on that where that full season cover crop was on the PP and he was, he was doing fine spraying across that and then he got kind of brave and he went over to the to the field or the part of the field that had been tilled all summer and his, his sprayer sank. Um, so it's pretty amazing what you can build up in one year um, as far as roots and soil structure and, um, and keeping and building that soil. I mean, it's, it's almost a, it's not a free year, but it's a, it's a year where you can really ramp up the, the benefits in building soil um, in those, in those fields. Uh, 
And I guess, you know, one of the other conversations I had this week was with a, a farmer in the southeast corner and he had some prevent plant last year. Um, he used a barley, barley radish pea mix. Um, and on part of the field, he had he had run out of peas or he felt like he planted him too deep or something where the peas just didn't establish on the, the prevent plant. Uh, but he was saying this year as he's going across it, um, putting soybean into the barley stubble um, from last year or the barley on the prevent plant that anywhere where he had peas, he felt like that residue was just, had just disappeared. Um, so it was kind of interesting to hear that too, that that areas where the pea established and he had, um, you know, that lower C to N ratio material uh, with his with his barley that it actually helped decompose some of that residue on the surface. Um, this is a long-term no-tiller. Um, so, you know, he's used to planting into a lot of residue, but in this case, he, he said it was just, it was kind of pleasant to go through those spots where he had the peas established in it and it got rid of some of the residue. And he said it wasn't a lot of peas. I mean, it didn't have to be a lot to to see that benefit. So if you need to keep costs down by not including a lot of a lot of peas in the mix, I think just some will um, will be some benefit. But be sure to inoculate. That's the step I always forget. <laughs> I plant these legumes there. You know, I planted some faba one year and I, faba beans, and I totally forgot to inoculate. And I'm bummed about that because the nodules that they put on are so great um, when inoculated. Yeah, that's a great point, Abby. And one thing, too, that we always kind of run into is that um, when it comes to a lot of the different pulses, so like the peas or um, edible beans, I guess you could even throw soybeans in that mix, too, because that's one that gets questioned a lot, is they all have different strains of rhizobia for the inoculant. So uh, we do get a lot of questions about, well, I have some leftover soybean inoculant from whenever and I want to include peas or lentils or whatever it might be in my mix can I just use that and it's like well no I mean if you want to throw it in there to get rid of it that's up to you but it's not going to benefit you and those peas aren't going to nodulate or and fixate nitrogen so it's just I mean at that point it's pointless but we do get a lot of people wondering about those things and Soybeans is different from the pea, lentil, vetch, different from the edible beans, the cow peas. So that's one really good thing to kind of consider too when you're talking about inoculating is just making sure that people realize that all of those different crops, even though they are similar in a lot of ways, do require different strains of uh, rhizobia in the inoculant. Yeah, next time I order seed from one of you guys, remind me to inoculate. <laughs> I always forget. Well, sometimes we forget to remind people too, and that usually doesn't end well. <laughs> now, Marisol, we don't usually use clovers after after wheat in our mixes because you don't get enough growth. In a full season, is it worth including a clover in a mix, or would is are peas still a better better fit for us? I think uh, clovers. Um, they never work very well. I think in a full season they'll work better. Uh, clean some clover. The cl clovers are expensive seed. So I think uh, they won't do any better than the field pea. And the field pea is a lot cheaper. So I don't see much of a benefit just because of the cost. I've seen them grow better, but the clovers in general don't grow very well in competition with others in the mix. I've seen beautiful crimson clover fields alone. But when you put them in a mix, you'll find them better in the other story, but I don't know how much actually they're contributing to nitrogen fixing or anything like that. So, so I, that's why I don't use them. After, the, after wheat or for the fall, there's just not enough time to, for them to even grow. But in the summer, I, you know, I haven't, I'm, I'm, you know, in, in other states, they love them. They love crimson clover, but I haven't seen it do really well here. So that's for experience that we don't have all the data, but I never seen like fantastic crimson clovers, but I know a farmer from North Dakota, I don't remember where he said that crimson clover did very well for them. So I think it depends on your area. If you, you've used it before and like it, that's not, you know, it's not a problem. You can use it. 
Mm -hmm. that, uh, we, we, I just haven't seen much a good performance from it. Do Faba do, do, I mean, I love Faba being in the fall, but if you were to put him in a full season mix, would Faba do, do well, or is it still a little bit too hot? No, I, I actually, we, we did plant it in our mixes, and it does, it does pretty well. Uh, but if, if you have like a grazing mix uh, or a hay mix, it'll go on the first cut and it won't regrow. So you plant it in the summer and then graze it uh, mid-summer or, uh, you know, July or August. Um, it won't regrow for fall regrowth. Now if you plant it like after wheat, probably does really well. It does like better cool temperature. These are cool seasons. But it, I've seen it, you know, we, we have it, but it doesn't become a big percentage of the mix either. Again, it's a, it's a price thing too. You know, if you want to keep the mix, you know, I love Avin because like Avi says, it's actually demonstrated is a, the most efficient nitrogen fixer of the animals. And they use it in a lot, of, in Europe, they use it a lot. But I really like it too, but it's, it's expensive. Um, see, it's big, so even if you put five pounds, you're not putting that much. And some rates are 40 pounds, that's a lot of money. And uh, so, yeah, I, th I think, you know, even if you'll be, my, maybe it's not as good as Fabine, it's a lot cheaper than Fabine. And it still fixes nitrogen for you. So, you know, all depends what you, you want to do. I always said, if you are going to grace it, you can afford to maybe spend a little more on your mixture because those animals are gonna put a weight and they'll pay for your investment a lot faster than if you're doing this just for PP or soil health, right? Where there is a, a benefit, but it's not monetized, so you don't see it on dollars. But when you have animals, you do see it. And so I always said, and I don't know if Abby agrees with me, that if your mix it will be for grazing, I think you can invest a little more in higher quality and more seed that are a little expensive like fava bean or, or some other other ones because you you will get the money back. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Do you is there anything that you need to stay away from um, if you're gonna hay the field that would that would reduce the quality of the hay or um that's a, a good question. Um, the thing is uh, one of the problems you know uh, with hay is is um, dry the hay. So um, even some people useful sorghum crop for hay, uh, it, it, it takes a long time to dry the stem, you know, especially if you get it to grow a lot. So I think for hay, I like the cool seasons uh, grasses with legumes like oat pea, barley pea, uh, things like that. Um, uh, brassicas are not good hay crops either. So if haying is your purpose, I would just stay more with the, the cool season cereals and, uh, and peas. Now you could put some um, millets in there too for one season if it's a fall season, because uh, millets will, don't have the problem with the stem of sorghum. Sorghum locks, you know, even if you cut it and let it sit on the swath to dry, um, this moisture is locked in the side of the, the stem. And unless you crack or condition the stems, you know, um, it, will, it won't dry, they won't dry. And it is especially later in the season, you know, we don't get drying days for that. So that's a limitation of, um, you know, big growing species like sorghum for hay. So, but cool seasons mixed with legumes work great. I don't know, Naeem, you have, um, some um, recommendation for that. <laughs> I would only say that sweet clover is slightly more salt tolerant than field peas if salinity is an issue. Um, not, it's not super salt, salt tolerant, but it's better than field peas. Um, but then I think there may be some problems when it comes to livestock. So, you know, that, that should be also kept in mind. There are some issues of um, livestock bleeding or something, you know. I don't exactly remember the word right now, but I think, but I think it's bloat name. Bloat, yeah. Okay. Yep. You're right. So that that should be kept in mind. But if you just start thinking about salts, I've seen sweet clover growing much better than field peas. But if you if you do not have salt issues, I agree with Marisol. Keep your costs down, 
and field peas will do basically the same thing. One thing for grazing or feeding, and I could probably pull this out and send it to you, Abby, but on page 125 this year, from the weed guide, we have our 125, 126 uh, restrictions after herbicide application for a lot of a lot of our herbicides. Most of the, that chart that we have is focused on the cash crops, but for instance, the one herbicide we can use in field peas, uh, we have it listed there of days or weeks after application before grazing is allowed. So if people do decide to use herbicides for weed control and then the grazing gets moved up to September 1, then that would be the big thing from a weed control standpoint is making sure you've had the, allow the allotted um, restriction between application and grazing or haying. I can make sure those pages are listed on the prevent plant webpage. I think I posted the weed guide on there. So, uh, mm. so I can make reference to those pages under the link. Yep, yeah, it's 125, 126. Okay. Uh -huh. So no, those pages are important. Then there's a chart on the um, herbicide residual, right, for cover crops? Yeah, on 115. And that, that's more if you're planning, planning to plant cover crops in the fall. Is, you know, that work is all kind of spring applied and then you know, late summer, early fall seeding. Um, but there is some other stuff on there, just kind of some at-risk combinations. That, that's more for planning your typical, um, which could be useful if you've made a herbicide application, got too wet to plant, and then want to put in some cover crops, you can see if, if what you had applied is on there as a risk for some of the cover crops you wanted to use. It's been so wet this spring, I doubt that's going to be the case for anyone, but another way to kind of use that chart in other years. Are there any other weed resources, Joe, that you want us to be aware of or, um, or make available? I could probably, if we catch a rain day, um, compile some things from other colleagues. I and mean, for prevent plant, it's more or less limited, um, just because it's it's kind of we all kind of go towards the same thing. If you keep it cheap, there's some broad spectrum options that we can use. Um, it would probably take a project, and maybe. If get an undergrad or something to go through labels, but we could probably for future years pull together some grazing restrictions or other things on the crops we're using. But typically for the weed guide, we focus on the crops we're growing uh, for grain more so than you know, a cover crop type option or a prevent plant type situation. But uh, certainly if I catch a rain day and an office day, then I could probably just mine and pull together resources from my other colleagues, but it's all going to be pretty similar to what we already have. Well, as soon as you do that, Joe, then we'll get really dry and we won't have prevent plant, right? So maybe you should just start. <laughs> They're saying if I do it today, it'll just start raining out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Abby, uh, the cover crop and pest, um, you know, report uh, Dave is putting together. You know, I know that um, there are people on the list to read that, but like if you provide the link on the soil health page. Oh, yeah. You know, it's specifically on this topic. And I was just thinking some people who probably don't know about crop and pest can still come to the soil health page and then read that. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's a lot of good information in there. Uh, 
I think that the main message people should keep in mind that it all depends upon our objective. What is our objective uh, when we are planting any cover crop mix on prevent plant acres or, you know, if you want to have full season cover crop, that is way more important. What, and then the objective will include what do we want to get out of the cover crop mix this year and what is going to be our next crop um, you know, in 2021, and like, um, you know, we should consider disease issues, weed issues. Once we, once we have, it's almost like you should have a board, um, you know, a drawing board in your kitchen or living room, and then you make these columns and go through everything, you know, and price should be also um, one of the main factors. And then you should go with the mix you want to do. Uh, because just buying a mix for the sake of planting cover crop may produce some results, but I, I don't think so that it will serve all the purposes. Yeah, I agree. And it also, it's important to, to basically just pick your mix and go with it. You know, I mean, I, I see a lot of people get hung up on, well, should I do this or that? And, and obviously there's a lot of options and it can get kind of confusing, but, um, but going back and forth and kind of wavering, on it too can be just as as crippling as uh, as anything. I mean, so so really just pulling, getting the mix you want, seed it, and just go for it. Um, that's a good thing too. And if you keep it simple, if you keep it with things that you're comfortable managing and planting, um, I mean, we're fortunate here in, in in our region where a lot of these crops that we're using as cover crops are crops we've grown as cash crops. So, you know, putting flax in a mix is no big deal for a lot of our farmers because they've either, they have a history of growing flax on their farm or they have experience with it. Um, you know, same with, with, you know, including a brassica in a mix because a lot of farmers have experience growing brassicas as a cash crop. So, um, so I think we're, we're fortunate in that way that we have a lot of opportunity to include things that we're, that growers are, you know, farmers are generally more comfortable including because they've grown it as a cash crop or their grandfather did or their, you know, great, great grandfather. So, um, so that's a real benefit. So really just putting a mix together, getting it ordered, getting it at your shop. So when it's time to seed it, you can seed it. Um, timing of seeding, maybe we should talk about that a little bit too. Um, it seems like if you're going to include something like a, like a brassica, um, like a radish that you would want to seed it after July 15th. Otherwise you have a chance that it would bolt and, and go to seed. Um, so seeding that type of mix after July 15th would be a good idea. Um, the other grasses and things like that, you can seed, um, you can certainly seed earlier um, and get that management going. I mean, again, it depends. If we have a haying or grazing option, I would say that we could go ahead and plant, I would plant the cover crop mix as soon as I can because then you could actually pretty much get two crops out of it. I've seen producers who planted their full season, I'm talking about full season cover crop, um, but they have livestock, so they grazed it and the regrowth, they hid it in the same year. If you do not have that option, then you may want to wait a little bit, but I would, especially in the Northeast, I personally would like to see all the cover crops planted by the end of July, because most years, um, you know, you want to get something out of it, you know, whether it's a legume, whether, you know, root growth, biomass. So that would be my view. But uh, the people who would be in the best situation are the ones who could either hate or graze it. That would be the, that would be the best thing. Hey, good morning. This is Caitlin Hain. Sorry, I'll turn my video on here. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> hey, I just, I do have a question now that you're kind of talking about some of this grazing because we're trying to figure out how to graze on PP. And so that would be, I think you have to wait till that after November 1st. So you would maybe expect it to be not alive by then, or maybe if you've got some cool season crops, but when do you seed that? to get the best growth and so it doesn't kind of get too mature before you want to 
want to graze it. And then the other question, I guess, with that is, can you swath graze instead to kind of maybe help with some of the biomass? Hmm. Well, I'm glad Marisol's still on the call. She gets off here in about seven minutes because she get on another one. So Marisol, do you... <laughs> That's a really good question, and you know, I've had that question before, and I'm thinking, yeah, if they don't change the day to September 1st, like last year, pretty much you're just going to have dry biomass in there, and the nutritive value is not going to be as high. Um, you know, um, the sorghum will dry, will probably get frost frozen in September, so um, so you won't have very high protein, you know, uh, forage, uh, but you have to think that. Uh, you have to balance so what you want it to function as a pp first right because mm -hmm. of put in a four and then get you're just going to get the grace after uh after november 1st now um you can swap grace it too i don't know if it gets any better i think that question would maybe go for for mary kina or miranda i i don't know if you really improve it uh maybe with swap grazing you you reduce the stamping, you know, and losses while the animals walk through the, you know, um, the forage. But um, I don't know if if we really help with that. Now you have more legumes in there. The legumes are gonna be dead and still be there. Now my my guess is like brassicas, kind of like the kale types or hybrids like Winfred. Most of them will be alive even by November first. Because they can take, I've seen them take 18 Fahrenheit without a problem. They're still green. And they still, even if there's snow, they'll stay green. So if you if you are interested in grazing, what I would do is to put some of those uh, like pasture turnips or kale types, which are more, more resistant to frost than radish, and turnips. So the, the, the Winfred is a hybrid I really like because I've seen it survive until the end of November <laughs> under the snow. And, uh, yeah. and then the forest uh, turnips, uh, like the pasha, the leaf types. I, so I would increase, maybe, this is, I'm not sure because I haven't tried, but my logic would tell me that I would try to reduce a little bit my sorghum and uh, really harsh stuff that is going to be very low quality uh, in the fall and try to bump up a little bit some of the brassicas. Uh, which I know they probably will survive for uh, the fall. And legumes, I don't know, you could have um, some forage bees and stuff, but they're probably going to be dead uh, by sure. then. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it, it depends how much balance you want to do um, if they don't change the date. Hopefully we know soon. Last year we're doing these meetings and then they announced that they change it to September. I don't know they will this year. Uh, so. Yeah, I know talking with Frayne, I think he said it's probably not going to happen this year. Yeah, that's but, what I'm thinking you know. because last year was, you know, was pervasive. It was all over the state, this flooding yeah. and the planting. I don't think they look at us so much. <laughs> they look at Iowa. <laughs> so if Iowa and Illinois have problems, there's a chance. We have problems, they don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think so, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but we're not as important on those decisions, I don't think. So yes. yeah, I, I, I doubt it, they, they move it this year. I think uh, last year was mainly because of other states. And mm -hmm. I don't think the states are having that problem this year, so. So Marisol, wouldn't it be better like uh, keeping in view the November 1st date, if we planted the mix you were suggesting, say around the end of July or maybe early August? Uh, well, if, that, that's a good point. It, you know, the PP is depend where you plant it. The problem is, um, well, if you decide to plant a little later, which will be better for forage grazing, mm -hmm. um, and but the quality is still going to be bad because they're going to be burned. Yeah, you know, they're going to be dry. It's going to be dry grasses. Now, if you plant a little later, for the kales and turnips might be a little better uh, because they're they're you know they're, they're going to do really well on that time of the year. Now the problem is you plant you wait until July, then that means you're going to have to control the weeds during the month before that somehow, you know, herbicide. You, you have to do something about it. So I think the advantage of planting the whole PP early, as early as possible, then the, the PP is taking care of the weed control. So you don't have to apply all the herbicides. So I think, again, you have to balance of where your purpose, but I agree with you, the later you plant, the better quality, but you have to consider for November 1st, 
Even if you have really white quality while they were green, and that green is going to be pretty much found by then. So, and as soon as plants dry, they lose a lot of the protein. You know. Mm -hmm. So one more thing I wanted to mention to you, Marisol. You mentioned the trampling of the, you know, for uh, actually that's actually better. Uh, a lot of people who are into soil health, they actually like it. The hooves, which you know, press the mob grazing actually. Yeah. Well, you know. I agree. So, From soil health perspective, <laughs> I was talking I was about. Just, I just, the cows, I don't think it helps, but yeah, <laughs> maybe, that's good. That's a good point. You want some something and very yeah. residue on the soil. Yeah, that's a good point. I like it. It, I it actually breaks like. down quicker. Uh, yes. it, it depends see, upon the mix too. But. Yeah, this is a good thing about this discussion. I see things from the more animal and plant side. You guys see the things below ground. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> that is good. No, that's a good point. You know, the, the idea of the discussions too is that each farmer situation is different. So the idea is that they decide according to their system, their objectives, their soil, you know, what they wanna do, their economics. And so they kinda see, you know, what different things. It's not like we haven't proved everything because it's impossible to prove everything. But I think uh, you can recommend some things that are out of logic and then they can decide it out of the balance they want and see how it works. Mm -hmm. so. so do you think though, Marisol, if somebody's gonna look at, you know, a high quality mix for grazing later, I mean, in those situations, could it economically work out that you would seed something just like oats for, have them out there for a couple months so you don't have to do the spray passes, but then come back in and seed, you know, that full season mix into the oats later? Um, would that economically- That could be a you know, possibility too. You have to come in double seeding cost, but I don't know. It has, it all depends, you know, how it goes. Some people, what they do is they put first a cool season, like OP, uh, you know, and, and then they put the other one. But if it's prevented planted, you won't be able to use it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, the problem is prevented PP sometimes, you know, it's true, it helps with the soil and everything, but it doesn't help you with economics because you can't really use it. Yeah. So sometimes maybe maybe skip the PP and do it yourself and that way you can have the choice of grazing it and do a lot of stuff and get the money back. So I don't actually, know. Actually, that's a very good point, Caitlin. What you need to consider is how much money you're gonna get through PP. Because say if you're not in that program and if you went with a very good, you know, economical mix, you could actually, even right now, you could get two crops out of as long as you have the grain grazing or haying option you could get two cuttings you know whether you graze it or you hay it so that's a that's a calculation for you which is more uh, beneficial for you and and that would be beneficial for soil health too mm -hmm. but then it will also bring you more return I actually, I'm starting to think now that what is the basic purpose of PP? If it is soil health, it doesn't serve any purpose. Why? Because they should let people graze our head. I've actually told this to the um, even senators that CRP, you don't let people cut, you know, the root growth doesn't go deeper. So what is the purpose here? Improving soil health or I don't know what else, you know? I cannot think of any reason. So, Caitlin, do your calculation because the other point is political and I don't know how long it'll take to resolve that, but do your calculation because you may turn out to do better by not signing up for PP. It would be better for soil and you may make more money mm -hmm. in 2020. Yes, it's something that people have to consider, you know, what to, I don't know, it would be nice that some econom economists will calculate, you know, PP, uh, money versus the rest. If you do grazing and haying and the gain you get on the animals and the soil health. I agree with Naeem. I, I never understood why grazing or is not or haying is not on the, it's not allowed. I understand why you don't want grain so people profit wise, but why grazing? You know, they just don't want you to make money over the PP, but. <laughs> But what's the point? I think it would really help a lot of people do cover crops in the summer if the BB will allow grazing or hay. So, all right, guys, I have to go and I got another Zoom meeting. I'm on the host, so 
Thanks a lot for everyone participating. This is always great discussion. I really enjoy it. Bye. Thank you. See you. Yeah, bye. So we convinced you, Caitlin, to go against the system and... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, not yet, but I i mean, it's, you bring up some good points. I think, yeah, you just have to kind of sit down and figure out if that's really something that would work or not for, for us. And I know that we've talked about doing um, on other land some haying and then grazing afterwards. So the, some of that is in the plan, um, but some of this, yeah, PP, just kind of think about it that way. So maybe have to reconsider a few things and see, see if it works. <laughs> And then convince Rob as well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or join us again to listen. I mean, each discussion is different. I mean, this week was was different from last week. So, um, so I kind of enjoy these. I get a lot of good information out of it. But we will we will post this recording of today um, on the Prevent Plant webpage through ndsu.edu/soilhealth. So if you want to listen to anything again, you certainly can. Um, Naeem's going to get in trouble with the senators. <laughs> but, no, this is, um, so if anyone wants to listen to this again, you certainly can. Otherwise, we will, um, I guess we'll just plan on getting together next week. Any last things, Naeem or Joe? Just want to thank everybody for joining the call. Yeah, one thing I thought about from the crop call yesterday that a week from today is the final date for soybean and dry bean. If I remember Frayne's comment yesterday. So we may have a better feel the scope of PP across some areas that are still trying to get soybeans in over the next seven days. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think as we go next week's Zoom, it may go from the planning phase to or early parts of planning phase to some action for some people. Yeah, that's yeah, true. As we skipped into the late June ones. Yeah, and I imagine that people will, more people will sign on too. Um, this has been really nice though. 20 has been about perfect for, for talking through different things, so. Mm -hmm.